Welcome to This Academic Life, episode 42. If you're interested in being a sponsor, then please contact us at sponsor at thisacademiclife.org. Hi, my name is Kim Michelle Lewis. I'm a professor of physics and associate dean of research. Hi, my name is Lucy Zhang. I'm professor of mechanical engineering. Hi, I'm Pania Newell. I'm also a professor of mechanical engineering. According to the Department of Labor, there are almost 2 million women veterans living in the U.S. Women veterans continue to make positive strides in education, career, and entrepreneurship, with many turning to STEM fields for their career choices. According to the census, women make up approximately 27% of STEM workers with women veterans pursuing STEM-related occupations at double the rate of their non-veteran counterparts. Today, we are honored and delighted to have Morgan Kerr, one of those amazing women veterans with us. I know Morgan through her thesis advisor and serving in her committee. I was so impressed with the quality of her work and her dedication while she was working on her thesis. Morgan is a civil geotechnical engineer and now is working in Portland, Maine. She received her Master's of Science in Civil Engineering from the University of New Hampshire. And she served in the United States Coast Guard. Morgan, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. We are honored to have you today. Can you please introduce yourself briefly and tell us about your educational background? I'm Morgan Carr, and I live in Sebago, Maine, and I work in Portland. And I just graduated from the University of New Hampshire, as Dr. Newell said, with my Master's of Science in Civil Engineering. I previously had a degree in environmental management systems from Louisiana State University when I was a bit younger. Go Tigers! And then I joined the Coast Guard and I worked for the Coast Guard for four years and decided I wanted to go into civil engineering. So I got a second bachelor's in civil engineering. And then in order to become a geotechnical engineer, you typically need a master's degree. So I ended up going to the same university and I used my GI Bill and got my master's degree and my second bachelor's all within four years with a lot of hard work and blood, sweat and tears. And now I'm here working in the field. Wow, that's so lovely. I didn't know all of this about you after all those weekly meetings. Can you tell us a little bit, why did you choose civil engineering as your major or your second, I guess? Sometimes I think that it's a little kind of weird to go from environmental science and then go to the Coast Guard and then all of a sudden you become essentially a, an engineer of dirt and foundations. But if you kind of step back and think about things, I, I started off in environmental science and I worked for a company that did environmental support services as an internship and they did things like drilling and geotechnical services and things like that. And so I actually met geotech engineers while I was working on my degree in environmental science. And by the time I was ready to graduate, I actually considered going to grad school for soil science in the College of Agriculture at LSU. But something was missing and I kind of wanted a little bit of adventure. And I really liked the mission that the Coast Guard had. So I joined the Coast Guard. And while I was in, I kind of kept going back to really missing sort of being able to be creative in your field and that sort of I was missing what STEM offers in my career in the Coast Guard. And I eventually went back to civil engineering and I found out that I think that engineering is probably one of the more creative careers that you can go into. So honestly, I just applied. I prepared to get out of the Coast Guard and I applied to engineering school. And here I am. And uh, I think it was one of the greatest decisions that I've made, or all of the decisions that I've made have been really great. But it kind of streamlines me into, into civil engineering, especially geotech engineering. Wow, nice. So can you tell us a little bit about the most memorable part of your graduate studies, beside those lovely meetings that we had together? It's funny that you say besides the meetings that we had together, because that's actually what I was thinking about, but it, it's a lot bigger than the meetings together. I think that you especially know that defending my thesis was probably the most memorable part of graduate school. But I think that 
the most memorable part of graduate school for me was honestly realizing that I actually had support and that's where those meetings come in. And this is something that I think a lot of veterans deal with too, is wanting to be as independent as possible in everything that you do. And it, it's kind of hard to take advantage of sort of open door policies and things like that. Because whenever I first started my research as a graduate student, we're required to perform pretty independent research. And most of us have just gotten our undergraduate degree where we're told what to do every step of the way. But I remember reaching out to my advisor after spending a month on an issue that I was having. And I think the most memorable part for me was the immediate email response back and then him being like, yeah, I'll meet you tomorrow at 10 and see if I can help you out. So I think the most memorable parts of graduate school for me were the small acts of kindness and open communication and realizing that the open door policy is actually applicable in the real world and not being afraid to be dependent upon someone else for advisement or advice or things like that. Everything's a learning opportunity. So it, it was a great experience for me. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that you had a good time and you had all these good memories. So I'm sure that it wasn't all smooth. You said that you worked really, really hard to get the, those degrees. And I'm sure that there were some challenging times. Do you mind sharing the most challenging part of your graduate study? It definitely goes back to sort of being independent. To relate this, hopefully, if, if other veterans are listening or if other advisors are thinking of taking on a veteran student, this is something that I've actually reached out to a couple of my friends who have also achieved graduate degrees in a STEM field or an otherwise very difficult degree like law school. And something that we talked about is definitely the fact that we are held to such a high standard in our careers that the option to do anything less than that is really frowned upon it. And while a military career or a life in the military can be really, really fantastic, we're essentially taken from a normal life as a civilian, and then they send you to boot camp. And within a couple of months, you're quite literally taught how to be a person in the military. But whenever you get out of the military, nobody tells you how to act. So you spend four years doing this thing where you're like intensely trained, like this is what you must do. And this is how you must act. And this is how you must talk to people that whenever you go into sort of an academic setting, it can honestly be a culture shock and you certainly feel extremely alone. And it's hard. It's especially hard for veterans to reach out and ask for help. Not because we're not supported while we're in, that's certainly not the case. It's just a different type of support that we receive. It's all very sort of bureaucratic. Like these are the steps that you do. This is who you must talk to. There's a chain of command, et cetera, et cetera. Not to mention we're often older than the other graduate students or, or older than our undergraduate counterparts. So you've got kind of like an age difference, but you also have that sort of experience difference where a lot of us have had very difficult careers or, or very difficult things have happened to us. So I think for veterans that that will definitely be the hardest part of your graduate career. The thing is, is that you can certainly do it, but I do think that it tends to be harder for us <laughs> in those terms and learning literally how to just act around other people and how to be kind of normal. Can I just jump in here? I so appreciate that very point answer. And it was very sharp in the sense that I have the opposite experience with veterans or even our ROTC programs that are integrated into the universities and colleges, because often when they are part of our leadership meetings and they walk in and they're fully dressed and it's like, how do I act? Am I saying the right thing? Did or their lieutenant or their current like, so then I, as an administrator for the university, become nervous because I know that their lifestyle is so structured and I'm worried that I'm going to say the wrong thing or I'm going to mess up the title, which is very important. And so it's funny to hear that we share the same experience in the same place. So I just wanted to share that with you. That's such a good story. And it kind of strengthens the idea that we feel different because we're treated differently. <laughs> Uh, certainly probably not me because most people don't know and I don't typically share that information 
but I can certainly understand that. And there's also other segregating factors whenever you're talking to veterans as well. So you have women veterans, of course, and then men veterans, but you also have those who served and were officers and then those who served and were enlisted. And based on my very small sample of people, I have come to understand that officers are typically more open or they seem to be a little bit more prepared to have sort of conversations with civilians or they're more prepared for real life. I was enlisted (laughs) and most of my enlisted friends, we were like, oh, like we're getting out into the field or into industry. And we're again at the bottom level, making our way up, but we're treated completely differently than we were even as enlisted members. If we were either the lowest junior enlisted or even E7s to E9s that I've spoken to have felt that way. So it's certainly, it's just a different type of person. What about in terms of support during your study? Have you received enough support or just like programs in the service that could encourage you or women in general to join STEM fields? The thing is, is that if there were opportunities that the Coast Guard especially had presented to people to encourage either women or veterans to go into a STEM field. I would have certainly noticed it because I was already sort of in that mindset and that's something that I've always been interested in. Not once did I ever see anything to encourage veterans to go into STEM fields. Every now and then you will see, typically the military will encourage people or active duty military members to take college courses. There's something called tuition assistance and they will pay for a college course here and there. And it's, you kind of have to apply for it and maybe you'll get it, but there's nothing really, at least on the enlisted side to encourage that. And I actually reached out to a friend of mine to see if he knew of anything in in another branch in the army. And I reached out, my brother and sister are also in the military, reached out to them. And I was like, is there anything that's encouraging people to do this? Because they have to know that we're getting out of the military. Otherwise, why is there the GI Bill? Why are there veteran benefits? People know that we're not going to stay in forever. And there's a lot of talk and there's a lot of push to really prepare veterans for the real world. But college is part of that. And so, no, my answer is no, is that really there's not a huge push to encourage people to go into STEM fields. And I'm going to say, especially if they're not already in them, in the military. It's definitely a talking point for the future. Hopefully, if anybody is listening, that's definitely something that should be discussed. But there are, of course, nonprofits I'm happy to discuss. But the military itself, no, I I haven't seen really anything. There are other scholarships that the GI Bill offers as well to pursue STEM degrees. There is the Edith Norris Rogers STEM Scholarship, and it encourages people to pursue advanced degrees, or if they're taking a little bit more time on their undergraduate degree, you'll get nine months of tuition covered or $30,000, whichever runs out first. So there are some things that that scholarship is fantastic in in and of itself. Great. Yeah. So something to be continued to be worked on for sure. Yep. So what are some biases that you have ever observed or have seen against women in the force are there (laughs) or are there not Uh, of course i mean there's biases i'm speaking to three women in stem i'm sure that you've experienced it in your life and i think that being a woman it's kind of part of us going through life too and that we will always experience biases whether or not it's related to our gender or sex or political or religious beliefs in the military or in the coast guard especially they they certainly try to there is a push to treat everyone fairly and equally, regardless of their gender. So me as a woman, I, you know, you you technically can't be biased against me, but I have experienced it. And it was actually for an engineering position at at my unit, funny enough, but I, I guess I shouldn't say engineering that they're referred to as engineers and they are the mechanics for the boats. And I think at my current, at that unit for maybe a year and I had gotten qualified in every billet that I could have been qualified in. I was a boat crew member, I was law enforcement, I was tactical crew member, pretty much everything that I could have done except for engineer, I didn't get that. And so a boat can't get underway without an engineer. And they basically, if something happens on the boat, the engineer is there to fix the problem. 
And I was sitting at the galley table with one of my coworkers, and he's a very, very good friend of mine. And we had sort of finished everything up at the same time. The difference is, is that I had gotten there a month after him. So technically I finished a month earlier than what you're supposed to. And one of our supervisors was sitting there and he's like, man, you've done a really good job. You're this qualified, you're this qualified. And, the, and it was everything that I was qualified in as well. And he was like, you know what? I think you should try for engineer too. And it, it was just me and him. It was just the three of us sitting at the table. And I sat there for a second and I was like, you know, like that's something that I could do. I also help out the mechanics on the boats. So that's something that I can do as well. And he was like, you don't even have to get qualified in it. Just see if you like it go through the qualification process and see if you like it. And that's an opportunity that I would have liked to have been afforded. And so I was like, you know what? Well, I'll just do it anyway. And just to see if I like it, I didn't want to prove anything. If I didn't enjoy the job, I wasn't going to try and get qualified in it. If it's something I didn't think I could handle, but just not being offered that, I, I couldn't see any other reason other than the fact that I was the only woman at my unit at the time. And looking back, I mean, yeah, that, that kind of sucks, honestly to think about that. And in the moment, you don't really think, oh, it's, it's because I'm a girl, but there's really no other reason we were the same otherwise. So yeah, it totally happened. Otherwise, I was so supported and I had a great group of guys and one of which ended up being the officiant at my wedding. Another was a groomsman. I mean, we are very, very close. I lived with them. You know, we basically shared a house. So I've seen it otherwise too. How can universities help women veterans in STEM? Is, are there resources that you would recommend that universities invest in that could help with the transition or the integration into the university from the military? For an all-encompassing for any veterans going into STEM, it would be great if any university wanted to sort of advertise these nonprofits that are available for veterans going into STEM. So I am actually a tutor for Army Smart. It is a nonprofit. It is tutors for veterans and the tutors are also veterans. So if you are a veteran and you're interested in going into STEM, maybe you're taking a math class and you're not going into STEM, there is a veteran tutor that will be able to help you sort of navigate class and your coursework. But oftentimes I find that my students, you know, will spend a good 45 minutes talking about math or whatever it is that we're doing at the time. But we're also discussing how to sort of navigate the academic life. In terms of women in STEM for universities, most universities will have a veteran student club or a veteran student organization. I wish that with all of my heart that I had been more involved with my veteran student organization. I wasn't. I did work for a VSO at a community college for a little while, and I was a little bit involved with that organization. I was taking a prerequisite for my engineering courses there, and it was fantastic. And I honestly don't know why I didn't continue on with it and my graduate degree and things like that. I, I may have been able to help someone that was close to me or someone else may have helped me navigate the academic life or the, the stress of graduate school better. But at the end of the day, what veterans kind of need is a sense of community and not feeling like we're alone because that's mostly what you'll find is most of us feel like we're totally, totally alone. So anything like that, it's up to the veteran at that point too, to reach out just make a leap of faith and try and talk to other veterans as well. So I have a follow-up question. So just thinking about the similarities, the first one that comes to mind is the org chart. Do you think that that's something that could be a way to acclimate? So in my mind, when I think about military and veterans and just all of the branches of military, I immediately see a complicated org chart. <laughs> And then when I think about university org charts, it also feels very complicated and you have the provost and the provost reports to the, this person and the associate dean. And so I'm wondering if that could be a way to introduce that there is still this hierarchy inside of the academy that is very similar to the hierarchy in different branches of the military. Do you think that could be a way to engage both sides I certainly do. I think that that would be great, especially for orientation. So most universities will have a veterans focused orientation. And for example, whenever I started my undergraduate degree in civil engineering, I went to a veterans focused 
orientation and it was different for graduate school. So graduate school is typically you do your graduate school's orientation, but the veterans will also have their own orientation as well. I think it would be great if they would consider how many veterans do you have in your orientation or that are coming into it. And then maybe sort of talk about the fact that there are people that you can talk to and this is how you go about it. But I think that that sort of level of maybe it being a little bit less formal will encourage veterans to be a little bit more independent and then actually realize like, no, like we mean what we're saying. Like you actually, we are a resource to you. This is something that you are paying for. This is a benefit that you've earned and you're going to do the work to get it. We're here for you, your educators and your advisors. I have yet to encounter an educator or an advisor that that wasn't there for me whenever I needed help or asked a question. It's just putting your foot out there to begin with and not being afraid to do it. Nice. Thank you for that response. What is your message to other veterans and especially women in the workforce? Do you have any top three things that you would advise or recommend to help? For women veterans, and I hate to only focus on women veterans, I am very proud to be a woman veteran, of course, but for anyone going into graduate school or going into STEM, or especially if you're transitioning out of the military and going into the academic field, I highly recommend that you take some time to decompress after you get out. That is hugely important. I did not do that. I went straight out and then straight into school. And it ended up being four years of just, I mean, I, I didn't have time to breathe, although I had a great experience. By the time I graduated, I found that I needed a little bit more time to sort of decompress and you certainly have to take time for yourself and your mental health. My second piece of advice for any veteran going in or getting out and going back to school is to know what resources that you have in terms of financial. School is not fun if you are broke. <laughs> Students are broke to begin with, but we've, already, we've sort of earned this really great benefit and we're all adults and we have mortgages and children and things like that and bills to pay, make sure that you know your, your benefits. Certainly, you know, reach out to someone. Your best resource is always other veterans. It will not be people that are still in the military. So try and find a, a subreddit or something like that. Reach out anonymously and figure out what your benefits are. And my third piece of advice is certainly is that you can absolutely go into a STEM field and especially to the enlisted members who maybe didn't have a degree before they joined the military. And now you're using this really great benefit that you have earned no matter how much time you've spent. And if you have the GI Bill, that is a benefit that you have earned and you should use it. You can certainly go into a STEM field and make really great changes in the world and do work that matters. Reach out to your veteran's office, find tutors. It, it's just, it's not impossible to do. And it's, it's difficult but it's not an unobtainable field to go into. And it, at the end of the day, I mean, it feels great. You're making changes every day that benefit the world. It's really scary going from being an enlisted member to, to doing this. And the amount of confidence that people think veterans have and how we stand and how we talk to people, it's not really that it's a show. It's just that we can deal with stressful situations in our job, but in the real world, small things are, are very difficult and then you can do something that's hard and you can do it independently. There are things to help you out there. Thank you, Morgan, for sharing your wonderful story with us and thank you so much for your service. We would also like to thank all veterans for their service, and we hope those who have been thinking about STEM programs are now more determined to join as we need more and more wonderful people like each one of you in STEM fields. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me on your podcast. It's been wonderful. And to any veterans out there looking to go into STEM, just do it. Just do it. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. You can follow us on Facebook and listen to our latest episodes on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, or Google Podcasts. If you're interested in being a sponsor, then please contact us at sponsor at thisacademiclife.org. 
Join us next time for the good, the bad, and the ugly of this academic life.